Hey there guys, you're here with Bo and thank you for tuning in to another video. Now today we're going to be discussing whether the US is planning on returning to a gold standard. Yes, that's right. There's been many indications such as the accumulation of gold worldwide by major powers, by strategic placements of certain individuals that are pro-gold or uh, anti-central bank and world bank into positions by Donald Trump. And overall, the sentiment gathering and some events and appointments that have occurred in the past couple of weeks are pointing more and more towards the gold standard returning, perhaps on a world stage. As we can see, gold has been on an upwards trajectory now since around 2015, as more and more world powers have been accumulating gold. In fact, gold being the highest, the, buy, the gold bank demand from central banks is the highest it's been in many, many, many years, in decades, in fact. So in today's video, we're going to be discussing the reality that the gold standard may be returning to the world stage. Fascinating stuff. Thanks for tuning in. Let's get into the video. Welcome back guys, thank you for tuning in. You are here with Bo Stoner from Cryptocurrency Australia, the channel where Bitcoin, economics and politics come together. Now today, we are going to be discussing and diving deep, I've done some deep digging today, uh, into the real possibility that the United States Federal Reserve may be planning on returning to a gold standard, a gold-backed US dollar. It seems implausible now. But by the end of this video, from what I'm going to show you, I think you're going to be convinced that something huge is underway and the Trump administration, with its strategic inputs, is sending signals that this is coming. And it's truly mind-blowing, incredible stuff. So just starting off, I just want to show you what the gold price has been doing. So anyone following gold price knows that gold has been on an upwards trajectory now since 2015. The price was sitting around $1,000, 1000 US, and now we're sitting here at $1,419. Now, for those who are used to cryptocurrency increases in price and returns, would see this as not a whole lot. But for gold, uh, this is a substantial increase, uh, around a 40% increase over a relatively short period of time, just a few years. Now, why is this? What explains this increase in the gold price? Well, it's because we have world powers have been accumulating gold for the past few years. Here we have an article here from RT, gold, a global gold fever. India follows Russia and China by boosting bullion reserves. The Reserve Bank of India is expected to add 1.5 million ounces or 46.7 tons of gold to its growing stockpile, which has reached record levels as the country appears to have joined the global anti-dollar push. The world's 10th largest gold holder, India, has purchased 8.2 tons of the precious metal so far this year, according to data from the International Monetary Fund. In 2018, the RBI bought 42.3 tons of gold. The regulator currently holds 608.7 tons of the yellow metal that accounts for about 7% of the country's foreign exchange reserves. The move reflects the current trend among global regulators. According to latest report from the World Gold Council, the central banks across the world acquired 651.5 metric tons of gold in 2018. The unseen year-over-year -year surge of 74% made the figure the highest annual total on record. Moving on to the next article here. This one is from gold.org. It's some research that was conducted. Central bank demand in 2018 was the highest since Nixon closed the gold window. Despite a decade passing since the global financial crisis, times seem no less certain. Central banks reacted to rising macroeconomic and geopolitical pressure by bolstering their gold reserves. These actions are consistent with a recent survey commissioned by the World Gold Council. 76% of central banks view gold's role as a safe haven asset as highly relevant, while 59% cited its effectiveness as a portfolio diversifier and almost one-fifth of central banks signal their intention to increase gold purchases over the next 12 months. 
Now, many people, including myself, saw this accumulation of gold originally as an opportunity for central banks to maybe offload some of their US dollars to diversify their treasuries with gold, especially moving into uncertain global economic times. It's certainly been uh, tumultuous politically on a global stage. And so the natural thing is to accumulate hard currency. Gold has always been hard currency, hard money, uh, to offset that risk. But perhaps they're accumulating gold for another reason. Perhaps in the preceding couple of years, they have been getting signals that the world, that the United States, may be looking to return to the gold standard. And maybe that's why maybe they're filling their treasuries with gold in anticipation that the United States dollar, which is the world's reserve currency, is one day going to be backed by gold again. I know, truth. sometimes the truth seems stranger than fiction. But honestly, I, I, the way I'm looking at this now, it seems like a plausible scenario. But let's get back to the content and dive into this even deeper. For those of you who don't know, here's a little bit of a history on the dollar and the gold standard from a blog uh, on our website that I wrote a number of months ago on whether Bitcoin could become a world reserve currency. I'm going to get into that at the end of this video, but let's just go into a bit of the history on the dollar and the gold standard. The gold standard was formed under the Bretton Woods Agreement. Sprung into life in 1944, this agreement ensured that the price of the US dollar stayed fixed to the price of gold. What this meant was that the US dollar note essentially was a guarantee for gold and an equity-based asset because there was gold underpinning the value of the dollar. It wasn't guaranteed by the government, which is current fiat currencies. It was a guarantee for physical gold. Other countries subsequently pegged the value of their currencies to the US dollar. So many foreign currencies, including the Australian dollar, including the Great British Pound, were also pegged to the, uh, to, to the price of gold. This gold standard remained during the decades prior to the First World War. Trade between countries was conducted with physical gold used for settlement purposes. Each country conducted trade had an actual stockpile of gold. Naturally, this stockpile, stockpile would rise or fall depending on the strength of their economies. So they couldn't just issue, these countries couldn't just issue, um, well, they could because they did. What they started doing was that they had, they had reserves of gold and the dollars in circulation had to match how much they had in reserves. But what they started do, doing during the wars is they started something doing fractional reserve lending where they were printing more dollar notes than what they had, than the gold they had in reserves. And this became a trend. So all these countries got into trouble when they had more money outstanding than what they had in reserves. So if everyone at one time went to go and redeem their gold at once, there wouldn't be enough gold in reserves. So it was almost a form of fraud, if you think about it, at, at a state level. They were conducting essentially fraud by printing more of these notes that at the time were backed by gold when they didn't have gold in reserves. Back to the article. On August 15th, 1971, the gold standard ended after then-President Richard Nixon announced the Federal Reserve could no longer redeem dollars with gold. Later in 1976, the price of gold was completely decoupled from the value of the dollar. Now, this was likely done this announcement where the Federal Reserve could no longer redeem dollars with gold, that was likely done as there was more dollars outstanding than what they had in reserves. And they knew that, and so the only thing they could do was say, well, you can't redeem this for gold anymore. So now we're going to have to guarantee the value of this currency as a government, thus turning into it, turning it into a fully-fledged fiat currency. And here's a video, actually, this isn't easy to find, but here's a video of President Nixon actually announcing the Federal Reserve could no longer redeem dollars with gold. And he goes for a minute or so. Let's watch it together. The strength of a nation's currency is based on the strength of that nation's economy. And the American economy is by far the strongest in the world. Accordingly, I have directed the Secretary of the Treasury to take the action necessary to defend the dollar against the speculators. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar 
into gold or other reserve assets, except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. Now, what does this action, which is very technical, what does it mean for you? Let me lay to, re lay to rest the bugaboo of what is called devaluation. If you want to buy a foreign car or take a trip abroad, market conditions may cause your dollar to buy slightly less. But if you are among the overwhelming majority of Americans who buy American-made products in America, your dollar will be worth just as much tomorrow as it is today. The effect of this action, in other words, will be to stabilize the dollar. So truly fascinating stuff there from President Nixon back in 19, uh, 1971, putting a bit of marketing spin there on, uh, you know, <laughs> the, the bugaboo around detaching the dollar from the gold standard, making it, making it so you could no longer redeem dollars for gold. Very fascinating stuff. Now, we're not going to dive into it too much there from here. That's just a bit of history and context around what gold is currently doing, history around the dollar peg to gold. Now we're going to get into what is looking like the Federal Reserve returning back to a gold standard. And this is going to blow your socks off because it blew my socks off as well. So let's get straight into that. First article here. This was back in February 6, 2019, all right? So this was just a few months ago. Donald Trump taps World Bank critic... David Malpass to lead the International Finance Agency. President Donald Trump says Treasury Department official David Malpass is his choice to lead the World Bank. Malpass, a sharp critic of the 189-nation leading institution, was described by Trump as the right person for the job. Washington, a top Treasury official has been, who has been a frequent critic of the World Bank, is President Donald Trump's choice to lead the International Finance Agency. Trump announced Wednesday he has chosen David Malpass, Treasury Undersecretary for International Affairs, to lead the World Bank, an international agency that provides loans to countries around the world for infrastructure and other projects. I'm certain there could be no better candidate to lead the World Bank than David, Trump said from the White House Roosevelt Room. He's going to do very well. Now over here we can see another article here from The Economist. Donald Trump picks David Malpass to run the World Bank. There's a few interesting little uh, tidbits here. The World Bank's board can expect to hear few warm words from David Malpass, whom President Donald Trump is expected to nominate this week to lead it. In his current role handling international affairs at America's Treasury, Mr. Malpass has described the bank as part of a giant sprawl of international organizations that create mountains of debt without solving problems. Two strands of thought shape his view, a conservative disdain for big, unaccountable bureaucracies, and a hawkish distrust of China's growing international ambitions. Awkwardly, the two are in tension with each other. So think about this strategically for a second. Donald Trump puts in the head of the World Bank, and we'll get into the, the role of the World Bank in a minute. Donald Trump puts into the head of the World Bank a guy that is critical of the World Bank. That reeks of disruption, right? That's what you do strategically. So he's put a guy in there that wants to bust it up long-term or limit its role worldwide. Now, what role does the World Bank play? Well, the World Bank sits hand in hand with the Bank of International Settlements and the International Monetary Fund, the IMF. So we have the IMF, the BIS, and the World Bank. Every central bank in the world falls under the purview and oversight of these three major banks. So just about every country in the world has a central bank that is governed by these three major institutions. So at the start of the year, Trump's first move is to put a guy that is anti-World Bank large banking bureaucracy at the head of one of these top organizations. Right, this is where it gets truly fascinating. So as we can see here, David Malpass was approved and he is now acting as the president of the World Bank Group. David R. Malpass, 13th President of the World Bank Group. David Malpass was selected as 13th President of the World Bank Group by its Board of Executive Directors on April 5th, 2019. His five-year term began on April 9th. 
Now over here we can see this is the Bank of International Settlements. BIS member central banks. Key word there, member. The bank's capital is held by central banks only. 60 central banks and monetary authorities are currently members of the BIS and have rights of voting and representation at general meetings. Here we have our own Reserve Bank of Australia. And we should have the Federal Reserve of the United States here somewhere as well. They're not in alphabetical order, so I'm not going to run through all those. Then we move on to the World Bank, member countries. All right. The organizations that make up the World Bank Group are owned by the governments of member nations, which have the ultimate decision-making power within the organizations on all matters, including policy, financial, or membership issues. Uh, here we go, browse by organization. 189 countries are members of the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. And here we have here just about every country in the world. There's only a couple that are not, and they're things like uh, North Korea. Now moving on to the IMF, International Monetary Fund. How the IMF supports effective central bank frameworks. The IMF promotes, promotes uh, effective central bank frameworks through multilateral surveillance, policy papers and research, bilateral dialogue with its member countries, and the collection of data for policy analysis and research. Multilateral surveillance, policy analysis and research can help improve global outcomes. The IMF has provided policy advice on how to avoid potential side effects from the implementation of and exit from unconventional monetary policy and established principles for evolving monetary policy regimes in low-income countries. The fund has also examined interactions between monetary macro-prudential policy and provided principles for the establishment of well-functioning macro-prudential frameworks. So as we can see there, there is the connection between the Bank of International Settlements the International Monetary Fund, and the World Bank, two global central banks, one being the Federal Reserve, one being the Reserve Bank of uh, Australia, here in Australia. There's the connection. So Trump put an anti-global bureaucratic bank in as the head of the World Bank. We now have connections to uh, central banks around the world and the Federal Reserve of the United States. Now, here's where it starts getting really interesting. So just a few days ago, Trump tweets this, I am pleased to announce that it is my intention to nominate Christopher Waller, PhD, Executive VP and Director of Research, Federal Reserve Bank of uh, St. Louis, Missouri, to be on the board of the Federal Reserve. Prior to his current position, Christopher served as a professor and chair of econo economics at Notre Dame. And then straight after that, I am pleased to announce that it is my intention to nominate Judy Shelton, PhD, US Executive Director, European Bank of Reconstruction and Development, to be on the board of the Federal Reserve. Judy is a founding member of the Board of Directors of Empower America and has served on the Board of Directors of Hilton Hotels. Here we have an article here. Trump picks Christopher Waller and Judy Shelton for Fed Board. Just reading a few paragraphs here. President Donald Trump intends to nominate Christopher Waller and Judy Shelton to the board of the Federal Reserve. The president announced his decision in a series of Twitter messages on July 2nd. If confirmed, Waller and Shelton could fill the last two vacant seats on the seven-member board. The Senate has already confirmed four other Trump appointees to the board, including its chairman, Jerome Powell. Waller is a director of research at the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, Missouri. The Senate confirmed Shelton in 2018 to be the executive director of the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development. The Federal Reserve Bank was originally tasked, tasked by con Congress with keeping inflation in check and preventing economic bubbles and recessions. The Fed dictates the nation's monetary policy through an array of financial tools, key among which is the interest rate at which banks borrow money. The Fed kept interest rates at historic lows throughout the presidency of Barack Obama but embarked on a spree of rate hikes after Trump took office. The president began openly criticizing the central bank in July 2018, calling it the biggest problem for the nation's economy. Interesting. Moving on to the next article. Here, here's the bombshell. Trump's Fed pick, Ju Judy Shelton, is a fan of the gold standard and other unusual economic policies. Key points. President Donald Trump tweeted on Tuesday his, inten his intention to nominate Judy Shelton and St. Louis uh, Fed economist Christopher Waller as Federal Reserve Board governors. 
Judy Shelton, who serves as a U.S. Executive Director at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, wrote as early as last year in support of pegging the dollar to gold prices. Questioned in a recent interview with the Wall Street Journal opinion page whether the U.S. Central Bank should lower rates, Shelton said, the answer is yes. Reading through a few paragraphs here. In tapping Judy Shelton to become one of the two Federal Reserve Board governors, President Donald Trump selected one of, the, one of the minority of mainstream economists supportive of a return to the gold standard and critical of central bank activity. There's another person critical of central bank activity. That's important to note. Shelton, who serves as the U.S. Executive Director at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, wrote as recently as last year in support of pegging the dollar to gold prices. Trump announced his intention to nominate both Shelton and St. Louis Fed economist Christopher Waller via tweet on Tuesday. Shelton's unorthodox monetary beliefs will likely draw questions from Senate lawmakers who will ultimately need to approve Shelton and Waller to the Fed board. In a post published by the libertarian think tank the Cato Institute, which as we know we've covered the Cato Institute before, was co-founded by Murray Rothbard. Murray Rothbard uh, being the one of the the kind of godfathers of Austrian economics. You can just see his bio there, was an American heterodox economist of the Austrian school. Interesting stuff. Shelton drew a comparison between cryptocurrencies and gold. This is where it gets really fascinating. If the appeal of cryptocurrencies is their capacity to provide a common currency and to maintain a uniform value for every issued unit, we need only consult historical experience to ascertain that these same qualities were achieved through the classical international gold standard, she wrote. In proposing a new international monetary system linked in some way to gold, America has an opportunity to secure continued prominence in global monetary affairs. Fascinating stuff. When you look at all the evidence, the strategic appointees and picks from the beginning of the year all the way to today, I mean, it's really looking like this is a is a a real thing. This is this is plausible. Nothing is certain. Things will always change. But I'm thinking that this is plausible. I'm thinking that Trump is positioning these key appointees that are anti big central banks to bust them up over time. As he gets more power and weight, more people into these key positions. The other key positions in the Federal Reserve are going to look to turn the Federal Reserve to a gold standard. If they do go ahead, other countries will follow suit. And then we'll have a, a, an economy based on a freely, floated, a freely floated commodity being gold. But how will this pay into, play into cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin? If this, if this happens... I actually think it's a very good thing for cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin. I don't think it's a zero-sum game. And I even wrote this article myself, which I recommend you go and read. Uh, a, Bitcoin, a Bitcoin world reserve currency, is it really possible? Where I actually go through why I think Bitcoin is a very good candidate to become a world reserve currency. And I still think it's relevant, even today. So I actually think that if, if the Federal Reserve does go to a gold standard, it makes me even more bullish. For Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. The value proposition as hard digital scarce money is still there. So anyways guys, that's it for the video. I would love to hear your thoughts and let and, and hear what you think about this, whether you think it's plausible. Do you think this is a reach or do you think that the evidence is pointing towards a return to the gold standard? If you liked the video, don't forget to leave a like. Always appreciate that. If you haven't subscribed, make sure to do so for all things Bitcoin, economics and politics. Make sure to hit the little bell button up in the top right hand corner to be notified of new content. My name's Bo. I appreciate your time. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.